Congressman Colin Allred. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jack. I appreciate it. So now that you are the Democratic nominee for U.S. Senate, um, how do you frame up this race with incumbent Ted Cruz? Yeah, well, I think this is two very fundamentally different views of our state and where we can go uh, together. You know, I'm a fourth generation Texan, was born and raised here in Dallas, as you know, uh, by a single mom. Uh, you know, I was lucky to get a scholarship at Baylor. Uh, and I want to serve all 30 million of us. And I think over my time in, in Congress, I've shown I'm somebody who tries to bring folks together around our shared values and try and see what we can accomplish together. And I think that takes us a lot farther than you can go on your own. Unfortunately, I think in Ted Cruz, we've had a senator who has been somebody who has been proud of being the most hyper-partisan senator in the country, who's, you know, I think picks at and pulls at the divisions in our society and pits us against each other. I'll be the exact opposite. And I want every North Texan and every Texan to know that. So Cook Political Report still lists this race as likely R. Uh, and so I'm wondering, what is your path to victory? Yeah. Can you do this with just Democrats, or do you need independents and Republicans, and are you actively courting them? Well, I remember when I ran in 2018 uh, that no one thought we were going to win that race until the very, very end, when folks started to catch on that it was going to be a very competitive race. And of course, I ended up uh, you know, being successful against a 22-year incumbent. And um, you know, the same approach here applies, uh, which is that we're trying to build a broad coalition of Texans. Of Democrats, yes, but independents and Republicans as well. I want every Texan who wants to have a senator who cares about all 30 million of us to feel like they could be a part of this campaign and that I will serve all of us when I'm in the United States Senate. I have a track record of doing that. I'm the most bipartisan member of the Texas delegation in Congress right now. I'm proud of that. And that's the way I will serve in the Senate as well. That's, of course, also going to be part of the campaign. Abortion rights is one of your messages, key parts of your campaign uh, for U.S. Senate. How helpful do you think that will be in this race to you? And you know, the other thing is, what do you support codifying Roe v. Wade? Yeah. Uh, some Democrats want to go beyond that. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Well, listen. I think what's happening in Texas is a tragedy. Uh, what's happening to Texas women? Uh, you know, we're just seeing reports just recently about hospitals that have turned Texans away uh, because they really are afraid of their liability if they treat a pregnant woman in crisis. Uh, and we're, we're seeing the outcomes of that. And what it looks like here in Texas is, you know, folks like Kate Cox, a mother of two, who has to go to the emergency room four times. Her doctor says she needs a medically necessary abortion, and her state says no. And what we're experiencing here is what a near total ban on abortion looks like. And the results have so many downstream impacts for us. It's a tragedy for the women and the families involved, but also it's going to be so much harder for our universities, for our businesses. It's going to have so many impacts on our state. So I want to go back to the standard that we've had for the last 50 years, one that does allow for regulation and then it has limits, but certainly one that I think uh, is much fairer and puts the, these decisions back in the hands of women in consultation with their doctors. So not to go beyond Roe v. Wade, you, uh, yeah, of you're course. saying Roe v. Wade. Yeah, and I want to go back to wh where we, I think we have been comfortable for the last 50 years and a standard that also is medically, uh, I think, important. Because when I talk to physicians and OBGYNs, I'll tell you, the position that we're in now is one where they don't know exactly what they can do. And that's what, that uncertainty is costing Texas women their lives. The Biden administration uh, recently announced $6.4 billion from the CHIPS Act mm -hmm. uh, as far as Samsung, yeah. uh, so that they can expand in Central Texas. There are other facilities in North Texas, mm -hmm. uh, and Texas Instruments, Global Wafers. How important is this to the Texas economy and to national security? Well, I think this is really important to talk about uh, because you know, Texas is a state that's probably benefiting the most from the CHIPS Act. Uh, we are you know, a state that uh, is seeing so much semiconductor manufacturing coming back to our state, expanding in our state. As you mentioned, I've had Texas Instruments in my district you know, my entire time. In Congress, they've always been a leader in this, but now they're expanding their business here as opposed to expanding it somewhere else. And so I'm really proud that we are able to do that. And, and I know that this is something uh, that around the world is putting us in a much more competitive position. And to, as you said, it's important for our national security because folks have to understand that everything we do, our phones, our cars, has these chips in it. But so much of that market is controlled and manufactured in places like Taiwan that are under risk uh, and at risk uh, from China. Uh, and so should they do what we all hope we're going to pre prevent them from doing, and try to move into Taiwan, that would disrupt the, the entire global supply and would impact us here in the United States so severely. So for our national security, we have to have our own domestic supply and also regain 
our own manufacturing position that we had and the, these chips that we created, you know, Americans you know, invented this, we should lead on this. Unfortunately, Ted Cruz voted against the Chips and Science Act, and I think that's a, that was a bad vote. John Cornyn, Cornyn voted for it. In fact, he's one of the reasons it got through the Senate. I'm one of the reasons it got through the House. Ted Cruz showed, I think, in that case, that he was, again, just putting partisanship over what's best for our state. Uh, the energy policy. Uh, in February, you voted against a bill that would have undone the Biden administration's freeze on approvals for n uh, new liquefied natural gas exports. Why did you take that vote, and does it hurt Texas? Well, that wasn't, yeah, that wasn't the exact vote. They were changing, I think, the, the, the process there of, of how it would be approved. I disagree uh, with the Biden uh, administration's freeze on LNG uh, licenses. I think that's bad for Texas. I think it's bad for our national security. Uh, and I, I joined a letter uh, that we sent to the administration, uh, Texas Democrats, saying that this is incredibly important for our economy. Uh, and so I, I, I disagree with it. And I think that LNG has a, an incredibly important role in our economy, but also in helping us wean our European allies off of Russian uh, gas. Uh, and to the extent that we make that harder, I think we, we make it harder for our allies to no longer send money to Russia that then is ultimately used attacking uh, Ukraine. And so to me, this is a, this is a part of an, a, a national security approach, but also so important for our Texas economy. Uh, and I want to make sure that Texans know that, uh, that I understand our energy economy here in the state, that I will be supportive of it, that I've pushed back at times on efforts uh, within my own party to uh, limit that. Uh, and, and that's going to be my policy in the Senate as well. But just to clarify, the vote was a no vote on, on this, at least according to the records I looked up. Is that accurate? Well, I, I, I'd have to check as well, but I, I'm, my memory of it is that it wasn't directly on trying to over, we have not had a vote on overturning that policy. It was a vote on changing um, the way LNG uh, is considered and, and whether it runs through the Department of Energy on the approvals process. So. Uh, we could get into it, uh, and I'm happy to you know, provide you with any materials on it. But m I have been, and I sent a letter after that decision was reached, uh, you know, opposing basically that decision and saying, listen, this is bad for the Texas economy and also for our national security. Uh, over the weekend, you approved funding for Ukraine. Why is that important? Well, I think it's critically important uh, for our position in the world, but also as the leader of the free world. Uh, we are uh, that beacon of hope for folks all around the world. Uh, we are the oldest and most important democracy uh, in the world. And so this is important that we have in Ukraine a, a you know, young democracy that's been attacked by an autocratic leader who wants to reconstitute the Soviet Union uh, and who is you know, you know, murdering civilians and, do, and committing war crimes. And what we've been doing is providing them with the tools to defend themselves. And I want Texans to understand that this is really important uh, because uh, should we not stop Russia in Ukraine. They will not stop there. They will continue into the Balkans. They will continue maybe into one of our NATO allies. And then we will be drawn into a direct confrontation with Russia. This approach, I think, is one where we're allowing a fledgling democracy to defend itself against an autocratic neighbor that's invaded them, which is something the United States has always stood up for, always stood up for folks to the right to self-determination and your ability uh, to make sure that you can make your own path going forward. Russia's trying to snuff that out in Ukraine, and I'm proud that I've been a part of standing up to that. Uh, we will see um, you know, what the Senator Cruz's approach to this is, because I've seen in the past that he's not been as supportive as I have been. And in Israel, uh, you also voted to approve funding for Israel. Talk to me about the importance of that in your opinion. And then also, my question is, should the Biden administration increase sanctions far more against Iran, which has very well documented yeah. in funding Hamas right. and other terrorist groups against Israel and elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. well, the, in, the funding that we provided Israel, I think, is important. A lot of it was to resupply some of the defensive systems that they have that, for example, stopped the Iranian drone and missile attacks from being much, much worse uh, than they could have been. And so that, I think, is really important. But I want Texans to also know that there's $9 billion in that package of humanitarian aid to help deal with the humanitarian crisis that is ongoing uh, in Gaza. So I think this is an approach that is the right one uh, to make sure that we continue to support our partners and our allies in Israel in a way that they can defend themselves, uh, but also make sure that we try and lead on making sure that you know, as much as we can, uh, we limit uh, the civilian impacts of what should be done against Hamas, who is responsible you know, for this conflict. And you mentioned of course, the sanctions uh, regime. And you know, listen, we have more sanctions on Iran than on any other country in the world. And I am supportive of anything that could be effective 
in terms of reducing uh, their ability to continue supporting groups like Hamas or Hezbollah or some of the uh, militias that have been attacking our troops uh, stationed uh, in the Middle East. A, lot, a big part of that, though, has been support from China. And so I, I, think, I hope Texans will understand uh, that we're dealing with really a network, uh, kind of an axis in some ways, between China, Russia, and Iran, and North Korea as well, of rogue states, of authoritarian states that want to attack democracies and really want to impose their will on others. But there are reports that Iran has been able to have billions, get billions of dollars just in oil sales, some of that. Most of it's to China, yeah, that's right. And so does that, does the Biden administration need to clamp down on that? Well, this is something I've been focused on, and I think this is, uh, it's, this is a challenge because this is not being done through the normal channels of commerce. Uh, we already have sanctions on that oil. What it's being done through is sometimes almost these like, ghost fleets or fleets that we we're having a harder time tracking. And I do want to make sure that as much as possible uh, that we can you know, prevent that. And that has to be part of our overall attempt uh, to bracket in Iran and try to influence them to be you know, a much more responsible, not that they are at all, you know, actor uh, on the world stage. And that's certainly something that I would support. Um, talk to me a little bit about what we're seeing on college campuses yeah. in New York City, uh, Yale, Columbia University, NYU, et cetera. Um, how would you describe yeah. what you are seeing and what the whole world is seeing? Yeah, well, I'm a civil rights lawyer and I am a student of the civil rights movement and I believe in the right to protest, certainly the right to free speech. I think this is crossing a line uh, into now threatening you know, communities, threatening you know, individuals, and making them feel no longer welcome in their own university or in their own town or in their own settings. And to me, that's unacceptable. And so that line is one that we have to maintain, that while folks have a right uh, to protest, um, you know, chanting things like, you know, that are deeply anti-Semitic or that are uh, you know, threatening uh, is a line that once that's crossed, then that's no longer a protest, it's now an aggressive action that's inflicting on the rights of someone else. And that's what I've seen you know, happening on these college campuses. And so to me, it's gotten out of hand. We have to get it back under control. Folks do have a right to express themselves, and I want to be clear about that. But it has to be put in the context that it's not crossing a line of impacting someone else to where they no longer feel safe, particularly for our Jewish students uh, you know, on those university campuses. This is a very, very real threat. And I do not want to see any student feeling like they're not going to be welcome in their own settings because of who they are, or how they identify, or how they pray. And some we're seeing reports that uh, one of the rabbis at Columbia warned about 300 Jewish students. Yeah, you know, I saw that. Um, should the U.S. Justice Department and Education Department be taking a closer look and doing more to protect Jewish students? I think so. I really do. I think this has to be a local, state, and federal response uh, at every level uh, to try and make sure uh, that while uh, you know, we're in this moment of tension, that no one is feeling in the United States uh, under threat for their own physical safety or uh, that they as a community uh, are being targeted uh, in a way that's dangerous. And you know, I, I saw, you know, of course, uh, you know, the rabbi's comments and I've seen and I've spoken with folks uh, who you know, feel deeply uh, you know, threatened in this moment. And I think we've seen you know, a, a serious rise uh, in anti-Semitic actions. Uh, and this is not just you know, the protests, but this is also there's actions that have, that have followed onto this that does warrant a response at every level of law enforcement. Uh, let's talk about border security. Uh, would you have voted for the bipartisan bill that was developed and then kind of fell flat uh -huh. uh, in, in the Senate, uh, if you were in the Senate at the time, or even if it got to the yeah, House right. now? Yeah, I was hoping it would get to the House, and I did support it uh, and put out a statement to that effect, uh, because to me this was a serious attempt to deal with what we are actually experiencing on the border, which is really centering in many ways around the asylum process. And, and I want North Texans to, to understand this. What we are seeing at the border is that a lot of folks are coming and declaring and asking for asylum. About 90% of those applicants are gonna be rejected ultimately. But it's taking us five, six, seven, eight years for that process to play out and for that rejection to be issued. And this was an attempt to really solve that issue by changing the asylum standard so that folks could be, uh, who would not be approved later could be more be rejected initially, but also by hiring more immigration judges, more administrative staff, more CBP and Border Patrol personnel to help deal with these surges. Uh, that would have been, no state would have benefited more from that than Texas. And that's why I find it really uh, hard to understand uh, why Senator Cruz opposed that 
when he knows what is happening along our border communities who are bearing the brunt of this, and we have an, a chance to act here, to provide billions of dollars of resources, to have a policy discussion about how we can fix this, this issue, uh, but instead I think he wants to run on the issue in November. And to me that has to be outrageous and unacceptable to every Texan. It's the exact opposite of how I would handle it. Uh, as far as the, uh, you know, that bill, uh, the Republicans have said, who opposed it, that it would give too much, it would codify allowing up to 5,000 people to cross. What do you make of that argument? Well, it's, it's a straw man argument. It was saying that if it reaches that number, then the president could shut down uh, the border. And, and so, listen, what we're really talking about here is we want to address the policy gaps that we have that are allowing us and forcing us into the situation that we're in now, where I think the asylum system and process is not working and in some ways being abused. This would have helped us address that. And I you know, was recently uh, in Laredo talking with some of our Border Patrol personnel we need more personnel as well. Uh, I'm proud that I've voted to fund the most Border Patrol personnel we've ever had. We're at the highest levels, but we need more personnel. They need more support. Uh, their mission is incredibly complex. It's not just dealing with migrants. It's also dealing with you know, very sophisticated narcotics trafficking coming from uh, these cartels and also managing what is our largest trading partner in the world, uh, which is Mexico. And this, uh, this incredibly important flow of trade across our southern border that's so important for Texas and for the entire country. And so to me, this was a, a good faith attempt, a bipartisan attempt to try and address this, and it went down because of politics, and we all have to recognize that. There was a House bill this past weekend, the End Border Catastrophe Act, or something mm -hmm. like that, and um, Senator Cruz put out a statement saying you didn't vote on it. Mm -hmm. um, what happened? Yeah, well, I'm disappointed that I missed that vote. The vote schedule was moved up, and I arrived a few seconds after uh, the vote was cast, and, and, that, and, that, and I immediately entered into the record that I would have voted against it. And what we need now is to stop, this is the second or third time we voted on this exact piece of legislation. That's uh, you know, a hyper-partisan, you know, one-sided attempt. And what we have on the table is a bipartisan bill that I know will help us address the issue, uh, and that I know we can also get passed through the House and the Senate, and that the President would sign. And so let's get serious about this. Let's stop having show votes that are not going to do anything. Uh, and, and you know, trying to you know, uh, use that politically instead of trying to actually solve the problem. That's what I've been focused on uh, you know, from day one. Unfortunately, we have folks like Ted Cruz who I do think revel in the politics of this, but don't want to actually solve the issue. A uh, couple more questions. I really appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. uh, should the Senate end its 60 vote rule on most uh, pieces mm -hmm. of legislation, do you think? I don't think so. You know, I, I'm someone who wants to reform the filibuster. I want uh, and I think that in some areas in particular when it comes to individual rights where it seems clear to me uh, that it, this is going to be very difficult for us to address that with the 60 vote threshold. And so I've called for carve outs at times or for an expansion or for a change in how it's, that's handled to you know, going back to the speaking filibuster. So I want to see a reform so that it, the Senate continues to be a place where bipartisan legislation can happen. Uh, and to me, that's, that's a you know, different character uh, from the House of Representatives where it's just purely you know, majority votes. Uh, and in the Senate, I think that that's part of the Senate character that has a long tradition of bipartisanship. That's certainly how I've served in the House. I want to see that preserved in the Senate. But I do think what we have experienced in recent decades uh, is the expansion of the filibuster to every piece of legislation when previously it was only applied sparingly. Uh, and so this is actually a kind of an ahistorical use of the filibuster that has made the Senate function much less well. Uh, and so I want to see us get back to having a functioning Senate. And there's some good ideas out there about how we can do it, and I want to find the best one that folks can get behind and that can actually help us now be more productive and help serve Texans and the American people. Should Congress increase the number of Supreme Court justices from nine? Well, that's not something I've supported, and it's not something I'm, I'm interested in. Uh, I understand you know, some of the impulse around it. I think that there's been a, a hyper politicization of course, for some time over these seats. But it really peaked, in my opinion, uh, when the Senate under Mitch McConnell, with Ted Cruz's support, held open a Senate seat you know, for 11 months uh, and refused uh, to fill that seat after Justice Scalia uh, passed away. Now, that, to me, has kind of you know, broken, I think, a lot of the faith around you know, how um, you know, these votes should be handled. Uh, and I think it's led to this position that we're in now uh, where you know, folks are calling for you know, these dramatic changes. What I want to get back to is having you know, serious senators, and to be a serious senator myself, 
uh, who will look at a jurist record, who will give them a fair hearing. You can vote for or against, but let's, let's you know, not hold open seats. Let's not say that we're going to try and you know, subvert the constitutional idea that the president has the right to appoint justices and that, and that those seats will be filled. Congressman Colin Allred, thank you so yeah. much. Okay, thanks, Jack. We I appreciate, appreciate you. It.